today we're going to be going through First Kings. We're going to be going from chapter 16 and um, through to 18, 16 verse 11 through to 18 verse 40. Um, I know this is a really big section, but we're going to kind of um, hold it down into one sort of overarching theme. Um, and so I want to start um, with you and ask you this question. I wonder, do you believe in the perfect ruler? I wonder, do you believe in perfect authority, perfect leadership? I want you to think about that. Hold that in your head. As we think about COVID-19, we think about Boris, right? Chief in command, the big chief. As we look to other countries, we look to their leadership, we look to governments, we see what, what do we see? Well, we see a lot of very confused, seemingly imperfect rulers. We see a lot of non-perfect leadership, right? So I want to ask you again, I wonder, do you, at this time especially, believe in this seemingly fairy tale idea of a perfect leadership, a perfect kingship, a perfect authority? So I want you to hold that thought, and let's look at today's study. First Kings, turn with me to chapter 16. We're going to go from verse 11 through to 18, verse 40. So turn with me, keep your Bibles open, and we're going to pray to God for help before we do anything. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you and we ask for your help um, this afternoon. We know that your ways are higher than our ways. We know your ways are higher um, than we could ever fathom. And we know that um, your words are, are beyond our comprehension because we're human. So God, we pray for help in understanding your word. Um, God, we want to listen. So would you rid us of any distraction? Um, and God, would you open up the eyes of our hearts to hear what you have to say to us today from First Kings? And we pray this. In the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit and in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So First Kings, hope you still have it open. And um, just by way of picture of where we are, First Kings, it starts with the death of David and then his son Solomon takes over. And these kings weren't perfect. This is going to be demonstrated in our passage. These kings weren't perfect and therefore they led the people into sin as it comes down. And, and we see the kings, they all did wrong and they led the people into sin. And that's where we're going to pick up today. So we see the people of Israel, they're split in two, um, Israel and Judea, um, just by way of background. But it's all going downhill. Okay, so we're starting here. It's all going downhill. Fake worship, straying from God. And where we are, chapter 16 to 18, we see that the prophet Elijah is sent. And it's, it's because of God's sovereign grace. God's sovereign grace means that he wants to send Elijah to warn the people. He still loves the people. He wants to demonstrate this by sending Elijah to sort of a very serious warning and exhortation to follow God, to acknowledge God as their only God. Um, and so what we see here is a progressing sort of pattern um, of leadership and that brings people down and down. And then Elijah is sent to say, you know what, we've got to follow God. We've got to put God back on his throne in our lives and in our hearts. So today, as we pick up our um, studies, as we pick up um, our narrative where we are, um, we're going to see as we journey, one overarching sort of stark contrast, one big theme that I want you to remember, and these are two kingships, okay? We see two types of rulership, two authority. First, we see man's pathetic kingship, man's pathetic kingship, and then secondly, we see God's perfect and proven kingship. And I'm no expert on first kings, um, I'm sure you know that, um, but I believe if we're gonna pull a brief thought um, from today's um, reading that this is, this is a, it's a real contrast, a stark, juxtaposition, man's pathetic kingship and God's perfect and proven kingship. So man's perfect, uh, man's pathetic kingship and God's proven and perfect kingship. That's what we're going to see today. So let's start from the start. Um, the only logical place to start, eh? So chapter 16, turn with me. Um, chapter 16, look with me, shows a short summary of the reign of Israel. Verse 1 to 6, King Basha. 6 to 10, Elah. 10 to 20, Zimri. 21 28, Omri, and Ahab, verse 28, through the whole way to chapter 22. And I know this seems like maybe a pointless list to you, sitting on your sofa watching this at home, but there is more here. If you look um, at the end of each ruler, at the end of each king, onto the next one, you'll see this sort of connecting verse that's the same for all of them. These kings were all different, but they all had this in common. They all followed evil, see it? And they all provoked the anger of the Lord. They all displeased God. Verses 2, 7, 13, 19, 25, 26, 30, 32. All of these kings were different people, but they all made the same mistake. They all followed evil, and they all provoked the anger of the Lord. So they all ruled selfishly. They all forgot who the real ruler was. They forgot about God on his throne in the heavenly realms. 
who gives them their throne. So what were they? They were pathetic. Man's pathetic kingship. Chapter 16 shows us this. Remember the scale, the progressing pattern of pathetic leadership, a constant failure to acknowledge God. What we see is Israel's white knuckle ride of sinful, pathetic leadership. Man's pathetic kingship. The first point. So what this chapter does is it brings us briefly man's pathetic leadership, man's pathetic kingship. So what's the contrast? God's perfect and proven kingship. Move on with me to chapter 17. Chapter 17 and 18 um, combined and they bring us the second half of our title. That's God's perfect and proven kingship. So chapter 17, um, this introduces Elijah um, and flowing through the narrative until now we see God do some um, pretty special things, especially now, chapter 17. Chapter 17, it really demonstrates this theme and hits it home here again of God's perfect and proven kingship. God certainly proves his kingship, his supreme divine authority over everything, over the earth, over everything in it. Look with me, we're going to see three acts of God's sovereign kingship. Three acts of God's grace, three acts of God's miracle working. And we see, firstly, look with me, chapter 17, verses 1 to 7, we see that God uses the ravens to feed Elijah. God uses the ravens to feed Elijah. Secondly, God provides a widow. Look with me, verse 18 to 16, God provides a widow and her home and he gives her and her son and Elijah enough food to eat when they had nothing. And then this one is really special. Look with me. Verse 17 to 24. God heals the widow's son. He became sick and he died. You see that? But God, he raises him from the dead and he uses Elijah to do that through prayer. So amidst all of this amazing content, God is working and he is so vividly working. I want you to remember though, our one focal point. We're looking at man's pathetic kingship and God's perfect and proven kingship. So what these do, these three acts of sovereign grace of God, they display to us God's perfect and proven kingship. God's perfect mm -hmm. and proven kingship. Okay. So from Israel's white knuckle ride of pathetic leadership coming down, we readers are now taken on a brief sort of whistle stop, as you see, an emotional tour, portrait of God's sovereign power, his perfect and proven kingship. And this theme doesn't stop here. Neither does God's display of sovereignty, mind you. Follow on with me to chapter 18. Chapter 18, flick over there with me. Chapter 18, um, this continues the theme of God's perfect and proven kingship. Second half of our theme, remember, in a sentence, chapter 18, it sums up God's proving of his kingship. He uses Elijah again and displays the perfect kingship um, of the God that we follow, of the Lord. Verses 38 and 39 are key. Find them there, 38 and 39. God proves himself to be the only God and that Baal and all other gods are therefore meaningless in comparison to our God. So chapter 18, what's the crack with chapter 18? It's simply displaying again God's perfect and proven kingship. He's proven it. It's proven. It might take a whole 38 verses for us to see explicitly that it's proven, but it's proven and it is spectacular nonetheless. God's perfect and proven kingship. So to summarize this journey, we've, we've sort of briefly been on the whistle stop tour we've had. Chapter 16, 17, 18, what do we see? We see this overarching idea, our main theme. We see man's pathetic kingship and we see God's perfect and proven kingship. So to wrap it up, what is the takeaway point? Well, the takeaway point is your main theme, man's pathetic kingship and God's perfect and proven kingship. Flick back to, to chapter 17 there with me um, and look at these three acts of sovereign grace of God again. God uses the ravens to feed Elijah, remember? God uses the widow in her home, provides food for all of them. And God heals the widow's son, who is actually dead. And he raises him from the dead through Elijah and the prayer and everything that goes on in the narrative there. And I want you to zoom in on that third one there. Chapter 17, verse 17 to 24. Let's zoom in on the third. God raises the widow's son from the dead. Remember, God's perfect and proven kingship. And I kind of help... But think of another occasion where we see this in the Bible. You've probably already guessed it. The cross. Jesus Christ, God's one and only son, he died. And he didn't die like the widow's son here of an illness, a natural illness. He, he was tortured and murdered. Jesus was tortured and murdered. And he too was raised. Except he did it himself. Furthermore, he did it for you. And this is all part of God's perfect and proven. 
paint it all part of the plan. So as you sit at home during the virus, um, and as you wonder what God is doing with this world, I wonder, do you believe in his perfect authority, his perfect and proven kingship, remember? Well, I suggest that you do remember this and you do read over it and you do think about it. Because God, the perfect and proven king, whom we've seen at work the whole way through chapter 16, 17, 18, he is still in control. Amidst this virus, it seems to be spinning out of control. God is still in control. And he still sits on his throne and is looking out for you. He's certainly in control. And furthermore, he loves you. So rather than putting your trust in man's pathetic kingship today, we know what men are like. We know what humans are like. We are humans. Hopefully you are. And you know what it's like to be a failure, to mess up, the, you know, to go far away from God, to follow that scale, certainly in your own life. But I want you to challenge yourself to believe in perfect kingship, to believe in perfect kingship, to believe in God, and to put your trust in perfect and proven kingship. The same God who raised the widow's son here, the same God who rose from the dead conquering sin and death on the cross, the same God who is on the throne today and in control amongst this sort of seemingly out of control virus, he loves you. He loves you. And so the same God who is on the throne today, the perfect king, this king who has perfect and proven kingship, God, he loves you. And so I wonder, do you know him? I wonder, do you know perfect and proven kingship as you sit here and watch this today? God loves you, I wonder, do you know him? I wonder, does he have your trust? God, the everlasting God, as we see here in the passage, chapter 16, 17, 18, it works in the lives of these people. He's at the work. He's at work in the lives of the people around us. Um, Christians that you know, he is working in their lives. And he has a perfect, proven kingship. So let's go back to our question at the start. In light of the contrast that we have seen today, um, that God has perfect and proven kingship um, versus man's pathetic kingship. God has perfect and proven kingship. I want to challenge you. Do you believe in his seemingly fairy tale idea of a perfect kingship? Because you should. The same God we see at work in the passage is working right now. And he loves you if you'll have him. So I want to challenge you today. Find this kingship. Trust this king. This perfect and proven kingship of Jesus. You know, Paul writes about God in Ephesians like this. Ephesians 4 verse 6. He says God is one God and Father of all. He is over all, through all and in all. Paul knows God's perfect and proven kingship. But I wonder do you, as you're sitting here, I wonder do you. And so I want to challenge you today, as we've looked at man's pathetic kingship and God's perfect and proven kingship, I want to exhort you, challenge you to look at this perfect and proven kingship of Jesus of the Father overall I want to challenge you find God trust in him today because he cares for you let's just pray um, before we hand back let's pray God we thank you that you are on the throne that you are in control even when it doesn't seem like it Father God we thank you that you have perfect and proven kingship and Father God we thank you and that you display that um, in the passage and you display it um, in the world around us even though it, it doesn't seem like it, you are working behind the scenes and God we pray that um, our eyes will be opened and the eyes of our hearts that you would soften our hearts to see what you are doing to see that you love us to see that you are still on the throne and in control and God thank you for what we've heard today we pray God that this would not just be in our heads but that you would move from our heads to our hearts God so that we would trust you more fully today we pray this in Jesus name Amen.